Hi, I'm Joe Ortiz, and along with Keith Gujer, I'm leading a writer's workshop at the Capitola Library. Participants wrote a story in five minutes, no editing, no revising. Just write as quickly as you can. The limitations used are intended to trick writers' minds into avoiding any thinking process and simply writing from their gut. The guidelines which help to create a compression chamber of automatic writing were as follows. Writing their story on a 5 by 8 inch card, sticking to a set time limit, choosing a specific method, for example starting with a sentence or ending with a sentence, or the classic story structure of beginning, middle, and end, or not caring about what comes up, just writing it down impulsively, and finally not stopping to edit as you go. Here are some of those stories. I'm seeing someone. I met him under the kitchen sink. He was hiding behind the dustpan. I took him out and dusted him off and he unfolded into long and lanky. He embarrassed me. I put him back. The next day, I met him on my walk at the beach. It was a much better place for meeting people. I waved, he waved back with a quick smile and passed on by. I might have passed him on my way back, but I can't be sure. We all looked the same to me out there walking, struggling along in our determined to exercise sort of way, unless we have dogs, which I don't. Luckily, I didn't have to put him away. He was long gone, I'm a fast walker. The sun was shining while we waited for an introduction. I commented to my friends, He's tall, dark, and handsome, isn't he? He'd fit just right on Wall Street if he had a briefcase. He stared at me and walked towards our escort and whispered, Did I insult him? The escort came up to me and said, He offered my parents 40 cows for my hand in marriage. A friend commented, How much for one of these wives he has? And he said, about three cows each. Well, take it, because it'll probably be the best offer you're going to get this year. As we stood watching his four wives in front of their dung houses they had created. The end. I looked at her and she looked at me. She was at the end of a line of four women waiting to use the one bathroom in a small house at a big party in the woods. I wanted to talk to her. She intrigued me. She had cat's eyes glasses, thick and black, like a 50s college student, but she was older. It was hard to tell her age, and I thought later that I should have just gone and talked to her. Instead, I went out to the dance floor and watched a man in a black vest without a shirt flirting and dancing with different women. He seemed like a womanizer. When I was about to leave, I saw her again standing by the door and the man in the black vest was talking to her. As I left, I had to pass by them and I looked at her and she looked at me and I knew I'd probably never see her again. This is the story of... Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. And the story is about a willow tree. Okay. On the far side of the property, there's a willow tree. Presently, it is experiencing an episode of regrowth and recovery. Over time, the leaves rapidly expand into falling waterfalls of coiled greenery. The bark becomes more resilient. Adapting to its new environment, the branches bend away from the corrugated iron wall. In contrast, they reach out to the light. In its pursuit of the natural world, a competition between the various limbs creates a moving balancing act. Through persistence, the living form develops new experiments. And beneath the surface, as the trunk widens and the gnarled roots grow thick, the root system radiates and expands. Through the seasons, some growth withers while other sections flourish. And finally, the local animals, squirrels, finches, hummingbirds, and butterflies return to the tree along the road of their own pursuits of happiness. This is the last time, Edward thinks to himself as he takes in the room. The walls are splattered with ectoplasm and look as if someone handed a toddler a radioactive paint gun. 
The students are huddled guiltily in a corner, staring with pleading eyes over the five candles and the bloody pentagram. I suppose now you know why they're forbidden books, Edward asks tersely. The students nod, one hiccuping and hiding a sob. Is it really going to eat our souls? One asks, voice trembling. Did you tell them they could? Edward asks, bracing himself. Luckily, they shake their heads no, not as dumb as that one first year a few months back. Then you're fine. They were just trying to get you to agree to things. Did you make any contracts at all? Again, a shake of their head. Edward sighed softly. Well, that would make things easier. He sent them off, glad he didn't have to debate with demons that day, and began working on the walls. He now knew why being a janitor at a magical academy paid so well. The phone didn't even ring before she ripped it from the wall. Uh Uh-huh. Uh huh. No, I didn't know that. How? When? I leaned in. What are they saying? Shh! I'm trying to hear them. Sorry. Uh huh. Uh huh. How long? What? Shh! Sorry. Can we. Uh huh. Oh my. Okay, can we come down now? Uh huh. Okay. Thank you for everything you're doing. What? Oh, no, is there... What? Shut up! Uh, No, no, I wasn't talking to you. It's my son. Mom! Uh, You were saying... I see. I see. Oh, no, you you heard what? Oh, no. No, no! Mom! He's dead. 